just want to welcome you all again to today's to uh, today's webinar. My name is Steve Marsh. I'm the director of marketing communications here at Delta Dental of New Jersey. We are very glad to see all of you today. A um, couple of housekeeping items due to the expected attendance for today's webinar. All attendees are muted upon entry. Please submit any questions that you may have during the course of the webinar via the chat feature for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And also, it, please make sure that your Zoom attendee name matches the name with which you registered for this course. If your Zoom ID is a phone number or an email or a, your first name or anything other than that name, you're gonna to wanna to log out real quick and come back in with your full name. Um, if you try to change your name, it may, the system may not record that for uh, tracking purposes. And again, we wanna make sure that everybody gets their CE credit. So if your uh, name is anything other than your full name, please log out and come back in with your full name. And we'll uh, thank you for that. And at this time, I'm going to uh, pass this meeting over to Dr. Keith LeBeau, our Chief Clinical Officer here at Delta Dental of New Jersey. Thank you, Steve. And I wanna welcome everybody to this, uh, to this program. And we're very excited to have a wonderful speaker with us today, Dr. Amir Morsi. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about Dr. Morsi. He's dedicated his professional life to pediatric dental care. He completed his DDS degree at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, a pediatric residency at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and then a PhD in craniofacial biology from the University of California at San Francisco. He is a board certified diplomat of the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry. Dr. Morrissey currently serves as professor and chairman at the Department of Pediatric Dentistry at the NYU College of Dentistry on the medical staff at the NYU Langone Medical Center and the Bellevue Hospital Center. Dr. Morrissey currently serves as the Vice President of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, as a fellow of the Pediatric Oral Health Research and Policy Center and Director of the Comprehensive Review Course. Dr. Morrissey also serves as an examiner for the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Dr. Morrissey's research focuses on early childhood oral health his experience includes serving as a principal investigator on a number of federally funded grants, authoring or co-authoring over 100 published articles, book chapters, and policy briefs, including serving as co-author for the 2021 U.S. Surgeon General's Report on Oral Health, editing pediatric dental textbooks, and hosting the Dental Health Show on Dr. Radio on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. He also maintains a private practice in New York City. With that, Dr. Morsi. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Lebeau, for, for that introduction. Um, and it, it was uh, generous and, and way too long. And, and in fact, I think it's used up most of our time, so we're just gonna have to kind of quit there. Um, no, I appreciate that. I'm really, I am uh, so grateful uh, uh, to, you, to you, Dr. Lebeau and, and Delta Dental. Um, for inviting me and for um, uh, Softbones and their sponsorship and collaboration. Uh, this is, um, you know, th this is a strange time that we're in uh, now with the pandemic going on. And we're certainly all have Zoom fatigue by now and, and have just been uh, really had a avalanche of information thrown at us. But the silver lining, I think, is that um, we've gotten comfortable with these kind of remote um, virtual webinars, and it gives us access to, I think, some information and some opportunities we wouldn't necessarily get. So um, um, I, I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but just a couple of things. First, um, because of the, uh, the, the, the webinar format, uh, it's really tempting and really easy to get distracted. Um, and we have so many distractions in our lives right now. So what, uh, what I'm gonna recommend is we take the next um, hour or so to just focus, just be centered um, and be in the moment. Um, I know there's email and Twitter and Facebook kind of um, um, trying to grab at you. So what I'm gonna do is give you a media break about midway through. So that adorable Instagram, uh, you know, kitten video. You won't miss that. Um, we'll give you a chance to, to check on, make sure there's no memories. But um, uh, I encourage you to just turn everything off and just try to focus and we'll be in this together. Um, 
please enter questions in the chat as we go along. Um, unlike in 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 person presentation where you kind of have to wait, um, just jot them down uh, and uh, that way if they're fresh in your mind. If they're particularly timely, uh, Steve's going to jump in and and um, uh, and stop me and I'll address it right there. Uh, if not, we'll we'll um, answer them at the end. I've left plenty of time for for questions at the end, um, but I do encourage you to kind of put those questions in there, those comments. Um, I, I, I won't call you out personally, but it's a good way to kind of, um, uh, if you have that question, many other people do too. We'll also have a few pop quiz, um, and, and, and don't worry, these, these quizzes, they're multiple choice, you, they're anonymous, and you won't be graded, so um, you can relax. But um, I, I think it, it'll, they're designed to kind of uh, make you think a little, also, uh, keep everyone engaged. So that's kind of the plan. Um, let me share my screen here. All right. Um, there we go. Um, I'm, good. So you heard a little bit about my background. I'm not going to go over all that again, but I do want to say that, yes, my PhD was in craniofacial bone biology. So um, th this particular um, topic, hypophosphatasia or kind of, um, disorders of bone, especially those that affect the craniofacial structures and certainly um, the uh, 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 dental tissues have, have been an area I've really been interested in uh, for quite a while. Uh, my talk was actually in um, craniosensis, looking at how uh, sutures in the skull fuse and, and uh, when things don't go properly, they fuse a bit early. That's called craniosynostosis. And that's actually a feature in, in hypophosphatasia. So we'll check on uh, that in a moment. Um, also, I've had the good fortune um, of working with a number of craniofacial teams, uh, at, whether it's in San Francisco at Ch Columbus Children's Hospital in Ohio or here at NYU. Um, it, it, and that has been an opportunity to see a lot of really um, just uh, fascinating cases and work with a lot of really wonderful uh, patients and their families, but also to kind of appreciate that team approach to care. And so we'll touch on that a little bit as well. Just want to say ahead of time, I have uh, no conflicts of interest. And this is particularly apt in that it is February, which means it's National Children's Dental Health Month. So um, those of you who are celebrating, um, please uh, make the most of it. Hopefully we've all done something um, in our offices or out in the, in the community to to acknowledge this month. Uh, this year's theme is Water Nature's Drink. This is actually a copy of the poster that the ADA has available. Um, you can download them free from the ADA site. Uh, there's also some really fun worksheets and, and um, uh, crossword puzzles and coloring books uh, that you can get for kids. Um, but uh, I think this is a, a way to acknowledge every year for the entire month of February. Hey. Um, oral health, especially for children, is really, really important. Uh, and, and one of the major issues in, in poor oral health for children is uh, drinking sugar-sweetened beverages. That's why the push this year is uh, really to try to encourage water. Um, it's also very timely in that February 28th is Rare Disease Day. So this is a, a global event, actually, uh, and is held once a year, again, to uh, recognize and acknowledge raise awareness for um, a whole host of rare diseases, including hypophosphatasia. And they put out this um, really, I think, wonderful, just very short two minute video. I, I thought I'd share it with you. I am Tristan. Angelina. Namaste, Shafiq. Regina. Habari asubui, Javi. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Malaysia. No Brazil. Tunaishi Kenya. 
My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. Unisorutan. Para viajar e descobrir novas culturas. Anapenda kunitazama ni kipuliza mapovu. Ya el querido, os pelos bem minha família, né? Minhas paixões são minha fuga quando as coisas estão difíceis. Ada hari-harinya apabila melakukan perkara yang biasa akan jadi sangat susah. When your disease makes you feel isolated. It's difficult to walk. O varme pro log. When I'm tired. Afraid. O controle da doença pode ser desafiador atau mengecewakan bila saya kehilangan masa. Muda muhimu sana. But we learned to be resilient. Para apreciar os pequenos detalhes que me trazem alegria. Kumuona mtoto wangu wa kiume anavyofurahi tunapoenda nje. Nikijua anasikiza hadithi na sauti zilizo karibu. Mencari titik perhubungan dengan masyarakat yang tak pernah saya sedar wujud. Och var övinge på grund av människan runt mig. Their fierce support. Sua bondade inabalável. The big big love. Mina vänner. Kluarga. Infermeiras. Doctors. Support workers. Assistenter. Mashirika ya wagonjwa. Together we are a strong community. Nimeweza kuelekewa. Histórias compartilhadas que me libertaram das dúvidas. Oh, como se ele lhe... I am Tristan. I live with sickle cell. I'm Angelina. And she has CASC, a neurological disorder. Saya Shafiq dan saya hidup dengan ectodermal dysplasia. Regina, eu tinha leiomiosarcoma, um câncer raro. Who you need, Harvey? Ana SME, spinal muscular atrophy. You and Christian, oh yeah, har ui, me fa pen shorat. Esta é minha vida, sua resaia. And I am more than my disease. We are rare. Camira mãe, nós somos fortes. And we are proud. All righty. Um. Yeah, I, I thought that was just a really wonderful um, video, and it is, uh, it, it's really creatively done. Uh, I think it kind of gets to the the issue of rare diseases, and particularly for us as dentists, uh, a number of diseases, including hypophosphatation, which we'll talk about, really are have just a, a an extensive, very wide spectrum of presentation and signs and symptoms, uh, very often involving the head and neck, involving uh, dental tissues. And we need to be part of that community uh, that they mention. A lot of these are very subtle. Uh, and often the, the, the first presentation, sometimes the only presentation is in the mouth. And uh, so if, if we as dentists are not at least aware of them, we may not be the world's expert, but at least if we have in the back of our mind, uh, I think we can play a really significant role in um, identifying these diseases, is encouraging families to seek early assessment diagnosis, which usually leads to ear earlier and more effective treatment. Uh, so we're going to dive right in with our first poll question, just to get a sense uh, uh, of kind of where uh, what what you might know and what you might be uh, aware of about um, uh, phosphatasia as a rare disease. Okay, so let's uh, launch our first question here. You should hopefully see this on your screen. Oh, I see some answers coming in. Keep this open for about 30 seconds here. All right, I can tell you we've got about half the votes in right now. We have a clear leader. Not really. A Don't overthink it. Just go, go with your first gut. Just like they told you back in, in elementary school, right? Just go with your gut. And it's an anonymous poll. If you answer incorrectly, it won't be counted against you. Steve, we need some like Jeopardy music, maybe, or something like that. I could whistle, but that would just be annoying. Okay, we have 11 more, 10 more people to answer here. Good, another 10 seconds. All right. Here we go. I'm going to share the results now. All right. Well done. Yes, the correct answer is one in 100,000 births. Um, so, um, but, you know, there's a caveat to that. And thank you, everyone, for responding. Um, 
it, that's kind of the, the widely held number, but we really don't actually know. Uh, because as I said, like with many of these diseases, there's a wide spectrum and some are very subtle. Some um, are never diagnosed. Some um, are, um, you know, there's a suspicion, but it's never really confirmed. So that number is probably in the ballpark, but it, it's not, um, it's really hard to say. Uh, with a huge amount of accuracy. And again, that's where we come into play as well, is if, if we are more aware of um, uh, this, this, this disease and other uh, rare diseases, it can actually help us know more about it and learn a little bit more about the true extent of, uh, of the disease and all its different uh, presentations. So, I'm going to dive in and I'm going to give you a bit of background. Uh, I'm, I, I'm assuming some of you know something about hypophosphatasia. Um, uh, some of you may have never heard of it before. Um, and and uh, like many of us, you may have kind of just heard about it, but it, it's also um, very similar to some other disorders. So I'll try to give you some background um, and kind of walk through it. And then we'll get into um, some of the ways that it's, uh, it's managed. Uh, medically and I'll then spend a good bit of time on the oral manifestations and kind of oral health care for um, individuals with um, HPP. Uh, so it, it, is, it is relatively rare. It's um, often inherited, uh, but it uh, can also be sometimes a spontaneous mutation. Uh, males and females have about the same. Uh, it's really a result of low serum alkaline phosphatase um, uh, which is in turn a result of a loss of function muta mutation in the ALPL gene. So um, the, the alkaline phosphatase, that enzyme, is, is where the defect is. Um, so, and you can see here that tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase, that phosphatase, is really involved globally in the body when it, it comes to mineralizing tissue. So that's why it affects uh, virtually every bone, the entire skeleton, and obviously uh, our craniofacial structures and our teeth. Um, so you can see there's a, there's a number of different ways it can be inherited, either um, autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant. Uh, as I mentioned, it can be spontaneous. And if your bones don't develop properly, it can, it's not just, okay, it might affect, um, my legs or arms, it, it can really affect virtually all the systems in the body because you need good bone structure to have good respiration, right? Because of uh, the, the role your ribs play um, in breathing and, uh, it, it, and you need good to have good um, muscular skeletal development. So um, you need that to have good muscular development. So it's really across uh, uh, most systems of the body where this then has kind of downstream effects. Um, just a point of nomenclature, many of us will, will hear the term rickets. Rickets really is a general term used for really any time there's defective skeletal mineralization, uh, whether it's with hypophosphatasia or uh, a vitamin D deficiency, a whole host of others. So that's kind of an umbrella uh, term that's used in, in any, any disorder where you have that uh, poor skeletal mineralization. So I just want, so you, you might see those terms used interchangeably sometimes in the literature or in, in some case studies. So uh, I think it's just important to, uh, to realize that, you know, the, the hypophosphatation is, is, is not the same as a vitamin D deficiency. Uh, this is a, you know, um, a genetic mutation where the vitamin D deficiency usually, especially in developing countries, is a nutritional de deficiency. So what does this look like? Uh, the whole host of clinical manifestations, I, I won't go through all of these, but uh, it's highly variable. It can vary from really just being um, extremely devastating and um, actually cause stillbirth or, or death shortly uh, after birth. Um, through a whole spectrum of skeletal manifestations where there's severe bone pain, higher risk of fractures, scoliosis, joint mobility, um, uh, all, all the way in to involving other systems, as I mentioned. So um, that's one of the things that 
can often be confusing sometimes. Um, some individuals with HPP will have neurological disorders and there can be some um, delayed psychomotor, social uh, uh, speech development. Um, there can be uh, seizure disorders. Uh, um, there can be association with autism, but many individuals with HPP have no neurological deficits. So it, I always can um, providers to not assume, you know, when they're reading that medical history or they get a referral, not to assume that there is something. Even, even um, um, sometimes when they have fairly severe disorders and they're actually wheelchair bound, um, do not assume that there is some neurological, that, that should be part of the medical history that you gather and, and figure that out. Um, in, 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 you may ask, well, why is that if it's, if it's kind of affecting mineralization of you know, the long bones, for instance. We'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about craniofacial, but um, very often the, the craniofacial bones, the, cra uh, the bones of the skull don't form properly. There may be craniosynostosis, they, they fuse early and that inhibits proper uh, brain development. It can uh, cause increased intracranial pressure that can have a whole of kind of neurological effects that's why we see sometimes uh, some of these neurological disorders. Um, continuing along that spectrum, there can be then very just mild presentations where the only thing you see is some effects on the dentition. Everything else is, is fine. The rest of the skeleton is fine. Um, no other joint issues, bone pain, muscle tone is fine. Neurologically, they're fine. Um, but flipping it around, almost no matter how mild or severe um, the HPP is, um, there's almost always some dental involvement. Uh, again, that points um, at us and, and gives us, I think, a, a significant responsibility to be aware of this um, and can potentially play a, a really s important role um, in, in, in many of these individuals' kind of case history. Uh, so just to kind of give you a bit of a graphic of the skeletal manifestations, uh, you'll often see kind of this bowing of the long bones. And I think this, I like this graphic because it kind of shows you, well, what's going on kind of at the tissue level. And you can see here where you have kind of cortical bone, pretty dense mineralization, um, very narrow trabeculation, uh, and obviously no bowing compared to here where you have thin cortical bone, uh, poor mineralization, large trabeculae, and, uh, and the bowing. So I think that, that's a nice kind of graphic way to, to know what's happening at the tissue level. There is kind of um, classically six forms of hypo, uh, hypophosphatasia. I'll, I'll go through them. Uh, Quickly, we won't spend a huge amount of time on them, but I think it's helpful to know because when you, if you get these referrals, you'll you may see this diagnosis. It may be diagnosed as you know infantile HPP, and it's I think helpful to know uh, what those are and what the manifestations are, both in the kind of skeletal and the dental level. So, uh, perinatal; these are really often the most severe. They're often identified in utero, um, and th that can be devastating for when you know they get that ultrasound and they see and and they get this diagnosis um, because it 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 is very serious and, and can sometimes be fatal um, uh, but there is a benign form of perinatal which is um, it has some of these same kind of deficits in mineralization but can improve with age uh, so that's always uh, that's always good to know <clears throat> the infantile, so these, this really is defined by kind of onset of, of first symptom. Um, so it's typically by six months, sometimes even younger. And you'll see that craniosynostosis, we talked about that premature fusion of the uh, calvaria, the, the skull, uh, the bones of the skull. Um, you'll see muscle tone we talked about, and you'll see this premature loss of the deciduous teeth, of the primary teeth. This really is the hallmark that of the um, uh, of uh, infantile, and then you'll see in the next slide um, juvenile uh, forms of HPP. Uh, again, here the uh, difference between infantile and childhood is childhood juvenile kind of presents a bit later, 
Um, so there won't be any obvious signs until they uh, say are um, age two or three. You'll start seeing some of these, um, their, their short stature for their age, their gait is different. They'll have this bone pain, might be higher risk of fractures. Um, uh, then you have a uh, version. You can see also fractures, bone pain, fairly common. Um, dentally, you know, the, the, if, if there's a, this kind of adult form, so we have an adult onset, um, then the, the presentation of dental findings is not as consistent. Uh, so there, you might, they might tell you, well, looking back, yeah, maybe I, you know, my mom said I did maybe lose some baby teeth a little bit early, but um, uh, usually the, the permanent teeth are not usually involved. And then you have a very mild form, which is odontohypophosphatasia, which really is just the teeth. Uh, the, and, and the oral, there really is no skeletal involvement. Um, you'll, as you see here, it's a reduced dentin thickness, some large pulp chambers. The enamel mineralization may not be quite right. Uh, alveolar bone levels um, are affected, but uh, otherwise, uh, systemically, uh, no other features. So that's kind of a quick run through. Don't expect you to remember all that, but it's good to know that those uh, different forms exist. And the, basically the take home message is the earlier the onset, the more severe the disease. We're gonna jump into our second poll question. Uh, just get a sense of kind of what, uh, what you may think about individuals who have uh, hospitasia and, 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 and the, it can sometimes be confusing because there's other bone disorders out there. So um, uh, we'll take a few seconds to answer this quick poll. Okay, the answers are flying in. We've got a horse race right now with two of the options. And again, it's anonymous and you will not be graded. So feel free, just jump in. Looks like we just need about five or six more responses. We'll give it another 15 seconds. Oh wow, we have a, almost a two-way tie here. All right, I'm gonna wrap up the polling on this one and share the results. All right. Okay. So uh, I have to confess, this is kind of a trick question. So the, the correct answer is none of the above, actually. Um, and and, and I, I, I do purpose because it, 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 is, it can be very confusing. There's a number of uh, diseases out there that have kind of phospho or phosphate in their name. There's a number of bone diseases out there. Um, and it can be sometimes confusing. So um, that, and, and don't worry, you're all in the same boat. We, we all, we, it's very, very common to uh, confuse some of these. And uh, we're going to um, take a minute to kind of straighten this uh, out and kind of give you the, uh, the, the distinction between some of these. So how do you manage these? So, um, you know, let's assume that they've already been diagnosed before they come to you, their, their friendly neighborhood dentist. Um, um, then you really want to um, get as much history as you can, like we do with any patient, right? Um, work very closely with their pediatrician. Um, and uh, I just noticed my, my PowerPoint, I think, is British. It corrected my spelling of pediatrician in the British spelling. But, um, and then, um, and, and often pediatric and endocrinologists are involved. Um, so uh, don't hesitate to reach out to them. They're always eager to, to talk about this. Um, and and ha having just the fact that you're attending this presentation is going to give you some of that information, so you can you can really talk to them and and ask the right questions and 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 be well versed in this enough to kind of just hey look, I want to be part of the team helping to take care of this uh, uh, this individual. Um, so typically they'll run a number of blood tests. I'm not going to go through all of those. Obviously they're looking um, at a whole host of things, including. Uh, obviously alkaline phosphatase. They'll do radiographic assessments, uh, look for changes in the skeleton. And a lot of this is done to, to, uh, make, to kind of have a differential diagnosis, right? To distinguish 
what they that individual has um, and from other potential uh, bony disorders. So it would have been diagnosed this has already been done. If it's they're still in the process of figuring it out, especially if they're they're pretty young, um, then yeah, they want to distinguish um, whether is this HPP or is it osteogenesis imperfecta, kind of brittle bone disease? Is it a vitamin D deficiency, which can sometimes give you similar skeletal presentations? Is it uh, hypophosphatemia, which is low phosphate? So um, it, those, if a definitive diagnosis hasn't been made, then, then you really should ask and say, hey, look, have they narrowed this down yet? What are they thinking? Um, what other possibilities are there? Um, if they mark on their medical history, oh, you know, perfectly healthy, nothing is wrong with me or my child, but you do see some of these things. You see, you know, again, short stature, they're complaining of bone pain, some of this muscle tone issue. Then, yeah, I, and then I think a, a little red flag should go uh, up and um, don't expect you to make this diagnosis. This is when a little gentle push from us can be enough to convince that, uh, that mother to take their child to kind of an endocrinologist, uh, pursue this a little further, or uh, a, a teenager to speak up and tell their parents that they're having some of these symptoms. Uh, part of this uh, kind of assessment will often be genetic uh, analysis to try to see, you know, if they can identify uh, some of the known mutation. Um, a, if it, the diagnosis has already been made, then genetic counseling is often involved for the individual and their family. Um, it, it's not uncommon to, that during this kind of genetic analysis, the, they will identify uh, parents or siblings, other family members that really have HPV. Um, they may have had a more kind of subtle form of it. They, and, but then, you know, when they hear, oh, you have that mutation, they, yeah, you know what? I do often get this bone pain or I got these joints that are really hypermobile or I, you know, I did uh, uh, lose some teeth early um, when I was younger. So uh, it, again, it goes back to that prevalence, that 1,000, a lot of individuals are really never uh, truly diagnosed. Um, uh, de depending on the severity, usually it's uh, supportive palliative care, uh, taking care of their pain. It may just be something as simple as, uh, uh, non you know, Motrin, Advil, ibuprofens. Uh, it, there may be other uh, medical treatments, but there really was no real definitive um, treatment until recently that could really actually reverse um, the signs and symptoms. And that's when enzyme replacement therapy came along. So take a minute to talk about that. Um, so, um, this enzyme replacement therapy really is uh, a way of kind of replacing that missing enzyme, that alkaline phosphatase enzyme. Uh, and it's really been a game changer. It really can increase bone mineralization. It's not just kind of a supportive palliative um, treatment and it can increase motor function. You can see respiratory function, just quality in, of life in general improves for individuals who uh, take this, especially they have kind of the earlier onset, onset and more severe forms, which really can be, you know, devastating. Um, so uh, this has really been a, a profound, um, had made a profound difference in managing. What's not entirely clear is, um, does it reduce tooth loss? So, um, you know, say you, you give this to uh, start giving it to a six-month-old, will there be uh, less uh, premature loss of a primary teeth? There is some indications that it does, uh, just a handful of smaller studies. Uh, still more research is needed, but um, it, there is some a promising indication that, that uh, in, in addition to its effect on kind of skeletal uh, function, uh, skeletal mineralization, and, and uh, things like uh, 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 muscle activity and bone pain that it may have an impact on reducing tooth loss. Here you can see this graphic. This is from White et al. This was a kind of landmark paper published in New England Journal of Medicine back in 2012. And you can just see, uh, you don't need to be a, a endocrinologist to, uh, to see the difference that makes between baseline, uh, which was at six months of age, 
uh, and just 24 weeks. They actually started seeing effects within three weeks of taking um, this regimen. And it's, it's a subcutaneous injection, typically three times a week, and can actually have fairly dramatic, very quick impact. So um, if you, again, it shows up on medical history that they're taking this enzyme replacement therapy, Strenzik is kind of the brand name, then uh, that's what that's uh, about. There doesn't seem to be any um, uh, complications, oral complications of note. Uh, again, it hasn't been studied a great deal, but um, nothing that I'm aware of. Okay, we're gonna take that media break that I promised you. Uh, we'll take about 30 seconds. Make sure you don't have any critical emergencies on all your media and your uh, email and, and everything else. Um, and uh, that way you'll feel rest assured to spend uh, the hour just kind of focused um, and uh, be uh, feel comfortable about kind of turning off all the other devices. And this is Steve Marsh again. Just as a reminder, there are a few people that are on the call still um, using phone numbers or uh, not your complete name. If you could just at this time, just change your name or send me a, a, a chat message, just letting me know who exactly you are so we can make sure that you get your credit. Thank you. All right, break's over. Uh, so turn everything off, we'll, uh, we'll move on. So a key part of managing uh, HPP is really taking a team approach. Uh, there, and you can see I've listed many, you know, whether it's pediatricians or surgeons or certainly us as dentists, but also pain specialists, um, PT, OT, uh, are all really critical. And, and, and the, the individuals who kind of have the greatest success are the ones who are managed kind of collectively in a team approach. Uh, it's not always easy to do. Some centers have a you know, a better kind of coordinated effort than others. Uh, but I think it's something that can really make a big difference. If you're a dentist, you know, in, in, in your community, I urge you to seek out some of these centers and some of these teams, offer your assistance, um, because usually the, the dentist, the dental care is the, the missing link. Uh, so uh, I really encourage you to feel comfortable enough uh, to pursue that. Um, the behavioral component is huge and should not be underestimated, especially as children get older and they get into teenage years. It can really be devastating. Uh, so making sure there's good psycho social support. And then nutrition counseling, which also kind of gets sometimes sidelined. Uh, sometimes it's just as simple as, hey, look, I got this fairly severe disorder. I'm not going to be worried about my diet. You know, uh, I, don't give me grief about eating junk food, right? I, I got bigger issues. Sometimes it's simple as that, but other times it's it's kind of medically necessary adjustment. So I've given a couple examples here. Uh, depending on their calcium levels, they may be on a calcium restricted diet or they may be on a low phosphorus diet, um, which can be tough because almost all processed food is high in phosphorus. Uh, so uh, again, working closely with a nutritionist and with the benefit of that is a lot of the kind of nutritional issues that affect their general health and their HPP also affect their oral health. So it's kind of a two for one. Um, so before we dive into kind of the, the dental oral issues, let's take another quick poll. This is the one um, just to kind of see what your thoughts are about kind of some of the oral manifestations of HPP. Third question is now live. We'll keep this open for about 50 seconds. Okay, we have a clear leader so far. I don't think you were able to stump him with this one, doctor. I, people are saying, wait, is this another trick question? Is this, you know, this seems... Looks like just about everybody's in. We'll give it another, just a couple seconds. All right, and here come the results. All right. Yeah, that was kind of easy. And I kind of gave it away earlier. So, uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. 
Um, and again, just a reminder, please, as you think of them, any questions, put them in the chat right now. That way they'll be in there um, and we'll get to them right when we're done. Um, so you don't have to wait to the end. Any stray thoughts that come into mind, just go ahead and put them in the chat. So yes, as I mentioned, um, it, this it affects bone, right? So the, the, whether it's the cranium, the maxilla, the mandible, all of the craniofacial structures can be affected. Uh, Craniosynostosis is a major feature in, in some of, especially the more severe uh, cases. It, this can lead to retracted maxilla. This causes cross bites and underbites. And open bite is very, very common, even without craniosynostosis. So uh, again, and sometimes if they're, if they're subtle, they haven't been diagnosed. This may just come up, um, you know, just through our regular extra oral exams, or maybe they're getting worked up for um, orthodontics and they're getting a pan or a ceph. Um, you might, and that might be the first indication that some of this is going on. Um, and this is another reason why it's really important to get a good family history, uh, because sometimes it's been undiagnosed uh, for several generations because it's relatively subtle. Uh, and in fact, yes, early loss of primary teeth is really the most common oral manifestation, typically around age two, but can be sometimes as, as early as, um, you know, before the first year of life, uh, 12, 18 months. Um, so this is really characterized by poor cementum. So remember our dental anatomy, dental histology days, um, the cementum just doesn't form properly. Uh, we also see very large pulp chambers, and this is thought to be because the dentin doesn't form properly either. Um, the large pulp chambers can lead to kind of just now, if you do get uh, caries, um, it's just much easier to have a pulp exposure, much easier to have pulp involvement. Uh, there may be more sensitivity because now you just have less insulation, right? So the pulp is a little bit more exposed to hot and cold and hard crunchy. So there might be a little bit of uh, increased sensitivity. There seems to be kind of in general, not a lot of huge data on this, you know, the extent of tooth loss may be associated with disease severity. So if, if losing one baby tooth early um, is often associated with a milder form, whereas losing you know five or six um, may be associated with more severe form, but that's not kind of just, that's, that's not certainly 100%. It's important to rule out, you know, is this truly early loss? Uh, you know, and, and we've all had them with parents, you know, especially if there's multiple <laughs> kids, it's uh, sometimes hard to keep track of, well, did that tooth already come in and then it came out or did it never come in? Or did, you know, little Jimmy bump his sister with a, you know, the toy truck and, and it was lost early. I, so, it's good to do a little detective work here um, and figure out, you know, is, was this truly lost or early because of something like HPP or it, was there something else involved um, uh, or was, or it's congenitally missing was never there to begin with. The real, the key distinguishing factor is the full. So um, if a tooth exfoliates naturally, say, you know, age five, six, you start your um, mandibular anterior, um, the kind of mandibular central incisors, they wiggle out, they get loose. And what wiggles out is the crown, right? There's virtually no root left on it. That's not what we see here. I'll give you an example. The one on the left is a photo. That's, it, you can see almost a complete root on this tooth that was lost prematurely because of HPP. Um, the tooth on the right here, that's what you would see in a normally exfoliating um, tooth kind of at a, at a normal age. So um, that's really one of the key. And um, so, and so let parents know, this is kind of where all that um, kind of anticipatory guidance we talk about uh, during those visits, especially that early visit, you know, when does a child normally lose their, their front teeth so that they know, Hey, look, yeah. Uh, losing a baby tooth at a year and a half is you know, that's not typical. That needs to be addressed and investigated a little further. Why is this important? As I mentioned before, because if, if that's really the only signs, the first signs, the, the quicker and faster that can be identified and then referred 
to appropriately, the quicker diagnosis is made and the quicker treatment can start and the more successful that treatment and that management will be. So that, that's really where, though this is rare, uh, you'd be amazed if you're looking for it, if you have it in the back of the mind, um, uh, you're, you're much more likely, obviously. If you never really have it on your radar, it's, it's very, very to miss. Um, and I think this all relates to the age one visit. So just a, a, a moment to talk about that. The American Academy of, Pedi of Pediatrics, the pediatricians, and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry um, uh, and the American Dental Association recommend all children see a dentist by age one for a whole host of reasons, but another great reason. So if you see them by age one, you can uh, first, if they've already started to lose primary teeth, okay, alarms go off, we can investigate that. But if they haven't, you can tell parents, hey, look, this is what typically happens. So that, you know, three months later, if they do lose um, that um, mandibular central incisor, they know, hey, Dr. Morsi said something about this. Um, this, is, this is not when it, this is supposed to happen. Um, and they won't just blow it off, they'll actually come. Plus also the earlier they're identified and diagnosed um, or even not diagnosed, but there's some features can get into a registry and, and we'll talk a little bit about that because there are a lot of benefits to the registries. Um, just, I'm not gonna go through this whole list, but I just wanted to let you know it's not just loss of teeth and, and, and large pulps. There's a whole host of others. And these can affect kind of the teeth across the lifespan. So it's primarily in primary teeth uh, and you'll see some uh, changes, more, some ankylosis maybe, hypoplasia. Um, but there is some thought that there may be increased risk of periodontal disease. The alveolar bone is not quite as vigorous and certainly the end of it. So it's a little bit more vulnerable. Um, and then if on top of that, you have poor oral hygiene and plaque buildup, then um, you increase that risk. Uh, the permanent teeth are rarely are lost early. Um, sometimes you'll have hypoplasia formation of the mineral of the permanent teeth. And so they can be at high risk of, of care. And it's not just the, the, the teeth. It's not just kind of the, the HPP itself. It's the management of H, HPP, right? So many of the medications that um, these individuals on reduce salivary flow or alter the quality of saliva. And that in and it itself can increase the risk of caries. So, um, and as I mentioned, just especially if you have the more severe forms, it's like any chronic disease where oral health becomes a lower priority. And it's just like, uh, you know, I don't want to be bothered. I got bigger things to deal with. Parents don't uh, want to have that nightly battle, um, you know, uh, there's, there's larger things in their mind. Uh, so all those things combined, the, the, the HPV itself, the, the things like salivary flow and quality and kind of attention to oral hygiene and oral health in general can contribute. One thing about COVID-19 is again, in general, all of us um, have found that hygiene is certainly decreased in the pandemic time. Again, a lot of other things on our plate, uh, but particularly uh, children and, and adults and and teenagers with HPP, this is uh, another confounding factor. Um, and they really need to be encouraged to maintain the oral hygiene. Visit your dentist, make sure they know it's actually safe to visit your dentist. And we've seen a number of studies out recently showing that in general, um, uh, adults and parents uh, and for their children are a little squeamish about going to the dentist. So I would encourage them uh, particularly um, um, uh, patients with various disorders. Also, encourage them to talk to their physician about the vaccine. Um, and there, it's not entirely clear if uh, there's indications or non-indications uh, of or contraindications if you have HPP, but um, it, certainly they should at least have the conversation. So let's jump into a couple of cases and uh, we'll talk a little bit about oral management, but I wanna leave plenty of time for some questions. Um, so this is a very typical kind of presentation. So this is a three and a half year old and just uh, lost the uh, mandibular central incisors early. Um, you can see on the pan here that uh, kind of the bone levels in, uh, in general are, are fairly low, the alveolar bone. So that's a typical presentation. The other 
teeth are fine. There was a little ability with the maxillary um, central incisors, uh, but you know, this could easily go unnoticed or it could be, oh, maybe that was trauma or you know, maybe they didn't, um, uh, maybe they're congenitally missing or maybe they didn't erupt properly. Uh, we don't, you know, getting a pan on a three-year-old is not an easy thing, right? So very often we don't have the radiographs to kind of confirm uh, these kind of things. Um, the second case, again, uh, a few more teeth were lost. Um, uh, and this is an excellent article in the literature. Um, and you can see how there is um, a number of things. Teeth were lost. Uh, the alveolar bone, very, very low here in this panel. Um, and then you can see the very large pulp chambers on the max therapy. So all kind of classic um, um, kind of oral manifestations in this four-year-old. I mentioned the registry. Um, so uh, there, there's a few of them out there, but I think this is um, one of the, um, the top registries. I know um, Softbones uh, works with them and uh, um, you'll hear a little bit um, more about soft bones in a moment here. Um, so uh, another good reason to you know, identify uh, this as early as possible. As far as oral health care, really, you know, it, the, the big thing is identifying it, is just saying, hey, look, is this just a variation of normal or is there something going on here that we should investigate a little further? Um, uh, and then once that, then it's really routine oral health, but at a really rigorous level. I mean, they, they need to be religious about it because it, it, they may be losing teeth early. So we need to, the, the teeth that are going to be, we need to preserve them. We don't want to lose them to decay. Uh, we also want to um, uh, give the, the teeth that may have some hypoplasia, they may have poor mineralization of the enamel. Um, as much help as they can get because they, there is an increased risk. So that's why in early intervention, uh, you can see here, this is our daughter when um, she was at, at about um, uh, six months old. Uh, that's my wife there kind of uh, diligently brushing her teeth. But um, the earlier, the better. We talked about the age one visit. And then you can really analyze, okay, how much fluoride? Are they getting fluoride in the water? Are they using fluoridated toothpaste? Are they brushing properly? Let's give a demo. Um, what about diet? Are they snacking frequently? And really, it's all about snack. It's not just about sugar and sweets and candy and juice. You don't want to overdo that, but it's really about how many times in a day um, any um, food or drink go in the mouth other than water. What about habits? Uh, thumb habits, uh, finger habits, pacifier habits in, in young children, that can have an effect as well. So um, we'd want to try to wean them off uh, maybe earlier than, than we would and get a little bit more assertive. And really just establish a dental home, making sure they have a place, and it doesn't have to be a pediatric dentist, but they have a dental home that can help coordinate their oral health, that can work with all those other providers in that team approach. Um, I wanna just mention caries management a little bit because it's not all about, okay, yes, we wanna prevent decay, we want to prevent trauma. So we, in that first visit, we talk a lot about um, how to prevent trauma. Uh, if they're older, active in sport, mouth guards, definitely because they are more susceptible. Um, but when, if they do get decay, it's not all about drill and uh, very, and, and very often we might resort to a caries management approach because of their age or because they have some neurological uh, issues or there may be just um, uh, financial issues, or they just don't have access to care. And we talk then about using interim therapeutic restorations with glass onomers and kind of partial caries removal. We talk about hall crowns, caries with SDF. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into that. That's kind of really another whole talk. Um, but the, uh, let me jump to then treatment. So um, ultimately, we do want to have definitive care. And so we want to treat the teeth. Uh, there's a whole host of kind of aesthetic ways if they do get caries where it's stainless steel crowns or uh, zirconia crowns. Replacing lost teeth in, in young children, primary teeth, is gets contentious a little bit. I, I have a lot of parents who, you know, as soon as the teeth are gone, it's just they see, wow, my child is going to go the next three years um, um, with having any front teeth there. 
um, I, I want to have something put, some uh, appliance, some prosthetic to uh, for the aesthetics. Um, and it can, they certainly can be done. There's removable, there's fixed. Um, they, they usually don't work well. They'll look good for a little bit, uh, but then children are going and they're growing very quickly at age three. So you're constantly having to replace them. They're fragile. Typically, they're often breaking. Kids usually hate them because they can't eat properly. Sometimes it affects the way they speak. So um, uh, often parents uh, decide, oh, maybe it's not worth the hassle. Or they'll try it for a little bit and realize um, it's not. But it's certainly a conversation that needs to be had. Uh, in older patients, um, there's not a lot of literature about implants. Um, in general, the bone heals fairly well. Uh, so uh, implants um, are not out of the question, but it's really on a case-by-case -case basis and should be done with an oral surgeon or prosthodontist or, um, who's really well-versed in this and works close with um, the, uh, the rest of the team and the physicians and the endocrinologists to decide if this is right. Same thing with ortho. Orthodontics is not... Uh, uh, can be very appropriate, but may have to talk, should this be traditional kind of band and, and brackets, or would they be better off with aligners, something like Invisalign, because it's easier to maintain oral health. You certainly want to have lower forces, because again, the quality of the bone. Um, so these are all kind of the, the features to take into account when trying to plan their kind of dental uh, care. They also need to know that uh, anything that's done, whether it's orthodontics or any of these other people, the prognosis is often poor and they need to be, they, it's good to kind of set that stage. Hey, we may need to go to plan B or we, we may put that prosthetic in and after remove it three months later, we may put the orthodontic appliances on, but then um, have to remove them. So that is, uh, uh, I think it's important to kind of uh, be pragmatic and realistic. Um, Lastly, just a little bit about kind of achieving some of this dental care. Again, they're young, they're apprehensive. Sometimes, again, there's neurological issues. And uh, sometimes uh, we would often use some kind of papoose, again, to protect the child. Again, you need to be really careful anytime you use these, but uh, particularly if there is bone, de many of these individuals have a higher risk of bone fracture. And now if you uh, incompletely, um, there can be issues. So uh, it's not out of the question to use these. And especially in emergent situations, uh, it's really uh, the best thing to use, but it's important to know kind of the limitations on that uh, and make sure uh, get really good consent and understand and parents and caregivers understand um, some of the limitations here. Um, so uh, it, it's really something you want to um, very, very carefully and enter in with very clear goals and knowing when you're going to stop or start. It's often very well tolerated. Uh, it, there's been some good studies showing kind of it's how you present it that makes a big difference. Uh, but going in with a game plan. Um, and if you certainly, uh, you know, if you use it routinely um, with your patients in your practice, then you're well versed in it. You may want to just use a little bit of extra caution in a child, a child or individual with HPP. Same thing with these devices that are used to kind of keep the mouth open. Again, often they're needed, but just a little extra care because of the issues with mobile teeth, um, teeth that maybe um, uh, don't have as much bone structure and also with craniofacial bones that uh, are maybe not quite as well mineralized and more prone to problems. All right, so I'm going to uh, wrap up this a couple of quick thank yous um, and then um, uh, turn it over for um, uh, a little conversation about soft bones. Uh, I just always, many of my slides here are derived from this book that a team of others, so I wanna acknowledge that because I certainly did, did not do all these cases myself. So I wanna always acknowledge uh, uh, my co-authors on this book uh, because uh, they did a lot of great work. Um, if you're not sick and tired of listening to me today, you can always tune into my, um, uh, radio show on Sirius XM, Dr. Radio. It's the dental health show. It's the first Monday of every month at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, uh, as noted in the intro, I am the vice president of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. They would take away my officer status if I didn't at least mention the APD. Um, wonderful resources 
uh, about HPP and, and other oral health issues for children on their website. Um, and so I urge you to go look for there. There's more continuing education available on the APD Education Passport, their online portal. And I, now I'm going to turn things over to um, Deborah Fowler to uh, talk to you a little bit about Softbone. Steve, she has to be unmuted. Yep, we're heading that way right now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. I, I was just sitting here saying, I need to be unmuted. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Dr. Morsi. That was a great overview of hypophosphatasia. And I think one of the most compelling reasons we're here today is we hear so many stories about patients who tell us that their dentist was the first one who led them down the path to an HPP diagnosis. And in some cases, um, these patients can be quite sick and the therapy can literally, literally be life transformative, alter, uh, altering their growth and their overall health outcomes. So super important um, for all of you that are here. So thank you. Um, we also want to be uh, mindful and, and grateful to Delta Dental for this opportunity during Rare Disease Week um, to spread the word about HPP and to tell you more about soft bones. So just to, to be real quick here, um, our mission is to provide valuable information, education, and support for people living with hypophosphatasia, their families and caregivers, and we promote research of this rare bone disease through awareness and fundraising efforts. So um, as a patient advocacy group, um, really, we focus our efforts in three areas. Um, we do education and awareness like these webinars, like you're looking at now. We have an annual patient meeting. Um, some of them have been virtual of late, but we also host them in person. We exhibit at uh, medical congresses. Um, we've been at AAPD before, uh, as well as some local meetings um, with support of Delta Dental through their SMILE grant. And uh, we create materials um, we actually partnered again with Delta Dental to create a dental fact sheet that has um, gone out to members and you may find uh, or have seen it as a, a valuable resource to help kind of get a quick one sheet view of HPP. And then we, we participate in awareness day activities uh, such as Rare Disease Day, World HPP and Dental Hygiene Awareness Month. Um, I encourage you to connect with us if you're looking for social media content. We're happy to share some of the um, Twitter cards and Instagram content that we created. And you can also uh, engage and, and honor any of the patients that you have who may have HPP. And then uh, we also work to connect uh, patients with dentists um, and orthodontists who have HPP experience. Part uh, of our work with Delta Dental is creating a dental referral list. So we have a list of dentists who have seen HPP patients or some who are interested in seeing mm -hmm. HPP patients. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they see patients who have other rare diseases. And you know, if you have a patient and you um, have a question, we can also work to connect you with someone uh, who has experience. Uh, for example, who, who's done orthodontics on uh, a patient who has HPP or maybe has experience with implants. It's nice to be able to make those connections and we can help to do that. And then um, finally, empowerment. You know, we, we are here to empower you to, to have more knowledge around hypophosphatasia. We wanna make sure that our patients are empowered um, and feel comfortable and confident in finding a dental home and have that peace of mind that they're getting the best care. And, um, you know, again, dentists are a part of, can be a part of a life-changing diagnosis for many of our patients. So um, with that, I wanna thank you and if you, have any interest in getting involved with Soft Bones, our website is softbones.org, or you can feel free to email me directly at deborah at softbones.org. So with that, back to you, Dr. Morsi. All right, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, so um, uh, yeah, uh, Soft Bones is a wonderful organization and, and uh, Deborah, you're absolutely right. I, I, I've had the opportunity to um, be involved in some uh, diagnoses of uh, hypophosphatasia, other disorders where the first indication was dental. Um, uh, it is, it, 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 it's amazing the impact we can have um, by identifying uh, these kind of very early features and it makes a big difference um, in how quickly they can get diagnosed and treated and often um, really improves their chances. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. Um, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, it's, we've gone a bit over, so, and it's been a long day, so uh, you may not 
um, um, you may be kind of petered out. Uh, my email's there. You can always email me directly. I'm happy to answer uh, uh, questions over email as well. But uh, I think we can we have uh, take a few minutes for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Morsi. We do have one question that has been submitted. It's on the the issue of the hall crown. Could you please describe what a hall crown is? I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, yes, uh, so. Um, the the hall crown really is a, a, a way of um, providing treatment for a tooth it, that is um, avoids a lot of the obstacles that get in the way um, for um, a, treating a tooth a primary tooth that really has a lot of decay. So essentially, it, it, the backstory is Dr. Hall in Scotland um, decided, hey. I don't have a lot of uh, um, uh, resources here. I had a lot of kids with a lot of big cavities. Um, so instead of doing a traditional crown prep and removing structure and uh, local anesthetic and caries removal, I'm just going to take a stainless steel crown, fill it up with some glass onomer cement, and just put it on top of this tooth. Done. No caries removal, no uh, local anesthetic, no high speed hand pieces. Um, and it goes against every fiber of our dental DNA, um, if there's dental uh, fiber DNA out, but it, it, it works. There's been now like five year closely monitored, really rigorous clinical trials following up on this, um, mostly in the UK. Uh, and it's amazing how well they work. So, you know, if we had another hour, I could go into uh, that and go in more into silver diamine fluoride. We're actually conducting an NIH funded uh, multi-site clinical trial here at NYU, um, looking at uh, silver diamine in preschool children. But these are some really, some, they do, they're not meant to replace definitive care, um, but it's another tool. So if you have a, a really uncooperative, you have a kid who's got a lot of other uh, kind of uh, medical issues, maybe can't tolerate sitting in the chair for a long amount of time. Um, you, you can't get good kind of um, um, uh, uh, stability. Um, they may, you may not have access to sedation or, or, or operating room general anesthesia. Something like a hall crown uh, or silver diamine fluoride can buy you some time or can be some alternative therapy um, for that particular patient. Thank you, Dr. Morsi. At this point, there are no more questions. Uh, you certainly can hang out for a moment here. Um, oh, we do have a question here. Can a hall crown work on adults too? Um, actually, they can. There hasn't been as much uh, research done uh, in adults. Um, the, the biggest issue is with adults is the occlusion. So in if you do it on a, you know, um, five-year-old um, on, say, a mandibular, you know, first molar, um, you put it on there and you got an open bite. Uh, obviously, I mean, you just got this big, huge crown, you've put it on top of there. Um, but you see them one week later, perfect occlusion. Um, the, the primary dentition um, is malleable enough at that age that things just equilibrate and sort themselves out. Um, and you, you really have very, very little occlusal issues. Adults are different, obviously. So, you know, if, if, if that crown is half a micron high, you're going to feel it, right? So um, in those cases, then, yes, there'll be some occlusal adjustment. It'll take more time, um, uh, and it may not get, uh, it may not self-correct. But again, if it's a patient who really, uh, some since they may not be, um, taking a lot of food by mouth. They may already have quite an open bite. Um, it's, it's another option. Um, also, you can do a hybrid hall crown where maybe you just reduce the occlusal surfaces, the occlusal, the cusp areas, just enough to kind of get that crown down enough so you get halfway decent uh, occlusion. There's some variations on. Um, but the key is it's the glass on them, right? You're basically sealing off the tooth and, and allowing the tooth to heal itself so now it's now sealed. It's not exposed to um, uh, any of the, the microbiome, the oral flora, and uh, allow that, that caries there essentially arrest and not continue uh, progressing. Okay. 
Thank you for that. And I don't see any additional questions at this time. All right. 